Okay, problem one. Bronson roared off on his motorcycle at 50 miles per hour, then much to his chagrin, he ran out of petrol. He pushed the motorcycle all the way back at 5 miles per hour. So if we just focus this uniform motion problem, we can see there's speeds happening here. Um, we want to focus solely on distance to begin with every single time we do these problems. So we have this guy, Bronson, who's on a motorcycle. He's driving along on his motorcycle for some unknown distance. And this will be him riding, so D sub R for riding. Then he pushes his motorcycle all the way back. All the way back tells me that wherever he ended up, here, he went all the way to his initial spot. That's the distance he did pushing. And I can see his riding distance and his pushing distance are the same distance. So D sub R equals D sub P. Okay. First step of these problems always is that step right there. Identify how far people went and use variables to represent their distances and get some distance relationship. I don't care speed or time when I'm doing that. All I care about is distance. So if they give me any distances, which they don't, 50 miles per hour speed, 5 miles per hour speed, 22 hours time, there's no speak of, speaking about distance in that problem. So that's all I have for that picture. So we have riding and pushing as categories. And riding his motorcycle, he went 50 miles per hour. I can see the unit of speed is miles per hour. That tells me my unit of time is hours and my unit of distance is miles. Um, he pushed it back at 5 miles per hour. That's his pushing speed. So they give us both the speeds. And again, that's what I'm looking for once I get this figured out, is I want to fill in these four boxes here with stuff out of this. Uh, so 50 miles per hour and 5 miles per hour is riding and pushing speeds. And in this case, they tell us the entire trip took 22 hours. This is very common. They do this quite often. Anytime they tell you a total time, they sometimes call it round trip took 22 hours. The entire trip took 22 hours. One of the times is t. It doesn't matter which one. The other one is 22 minus t. Since I put t there, I'm going to get his riding time is what t equals. If I put t there, it would be his pushing time. In this case, if this is 1, this is 21. If this is 8, this is 14. 8 plus 14 is 22, 1 plus 21 is 22. Either way you do it, 22 hours is the total. So again, entire trip took, total minus t is what the other thing is. It will be set up this way on the test. So be ready to do it that way. Once you've established rates and times using at most one variable, there's two things I don't know. I don't know how, for how long he pushed or for how long he rode. I don't know the time for either one. So these are unknowns, but they're using the same letter. 50 times t is 50t for his distance riding. This is a binomial, so multiply 5 times both. 5 times 22 is 110. 5 times negative t is negative 5t. I know the riding distance, this, equals the pushing distance, that. So if I put in 50t is equal to 110 minus 5t, that gets me 55t is equal to 110. Divided by 55 gets me t equals 2 hours. The question asks me very specifically, how far did he push the motorcycle? How far is asking about distance? What I found t equals 2 hours is time. So this doesn't answer the question they're asking me. So again, be very careful in these problems that you always answer the questions being asked. How far did he push the motorcycle? They're asking me specifically for this distance. So I can put 2 in for right there, so 110 minus 5 times 2 makes 110 minus 10, which is 100 miles. I could have also put it here, 50 times 2 is 100, because he pushed and rode the same distance. So it really doesn't matter which one you go back to, just make sure you find me the distance, not the time. The equation will find you the time, you still need to establish what the correct distance is for that problem. Number two, find four consecutive multiples of three. All right, multiples of three, if you consider what they look like, um, 15 is multiple of three, the next one up is 18, the next one up is 21, and so on. That's what multiples of three look like. If we figure out a pattern for that, it's a plus three pattern, that tells me if I've got some unknown n representing some multiple of three, n is a number that looks like these numbers. It could be 3, it could be 33, it could be negative 9. It's some number divided by 3. 
I know the next number up is going to be exactly 3 bigger than that. I'm trying to find 4, so 3, three bigger than that is n plus 6. 3 bigger than that is n plus 9. So there's my 4 consecutive multiples of 3. The book has a different way of doing this that's um, a little bit more difficult in my opinion. That's the most efficient way to do this problem. I'd recommend that. The magical words such that telling me the next words are going to be equations. Five times the sum of the first and fourth. Okay, five times the sum is five parentheses. The sum of the first and fourth, we're adding the first and the fourth, that's n being added to n plus 9, is equals 6 less than we ignore. 9 times the third, the third is n plus 6, a binomial, so 9 times the third would be 9 parentheses n plus 6. And 6 less than is happening after the word is, so we're going to modify the right-hand side of the equation with a minus 6. So writing the proper equation, it should be structured similarly to that. I'm not going to guarantee exactly the same, but uh, it should be close enough. Uh, translate, make sure you use parentheses where necessary. Uh, for me, I like to add stuff together inside the parentheses before I distribute. n plus n makes 2n. Can't add 9 to n's. Here, that's already ready to go, so I'm going to distribute immediately. I'm going to get 9n plus 54 minus 6. Distribute here, it's going to give me 10n plus 45. Over here, combine like terms, 9n plus 48. Let's move the 9n to the left and the 45 to the right. Both things I moved changed sign. 9n became negative, 45 became positive. 10n minus 9n is 1n, 48 minus 45 is 3. Notice 3 is a multiple of 3. 3 times 1 is 3, so that's a multiple. So we found a multiple of 3. 3 bigger than that is 6. 3 bigger than that is 9. 3 bigger than that, bigger than that is 12. So find four consecutive multiples of 3. I write the first one, then I add 3, then I add 6, then I add 9 to get the entire list. Uh, this should be a multiple of 3. If it isn't, go back and check your equation writing. Chances are you messed up there. This is a pretty popular place to mess up. We're getting parentheses nine times a single thing, but that single thing is being represented by multiple things. So parentheses are necessary, but it's kind of a little trickier parentheses issue there. Number three, the class treasury contained $45 in nickels and dimes. There were 600 coins. How many coins of each type were there? So we have nickels. We have dimes. And we want to have number of things and value of things. We do value in cents when we're dealing with coins. Nickels, I'm going to say there were N nickels and D for dimes. So that's how many of each thing we have. And I know that each nickel is worth 5 cents. 5 times N makes the amount of money in nickels. Each dime is worth 10 cents, so 10 times D is the amount of money in dimes. And if I start focusing on the facts and the problem, first fact they tell me is that there's $45. This is 5 N cents and 10 D cents, that's $45, also known as 4,500 cents. Be careful that we modify dollars to cents, add two zeros to a whole number, move a decimal point, two spaces for a decimal number, but dollars change to cents. So value variables 5 N plus 10 D is equal to 4,500 cents. Uh, quite often the value equation can be divided, all numbers divided by 5 here, so I get 1n plus 2d is equal to 900. So I, instead of going with this equation, I would go with this simpler equation with smaller numbers in it. Second fact, there were 600 coins. That's how many coins there were, that's a number fact. So number of nickels plus number of dimes is equal to number of coins. Just like that, I get myself a pretty simple system of equations. We can see that the n's are exactly the same, so I just have to change the signs in an equation to make this negative n, negative d, negative 600. This is what I want. This is the consequence of my action. Change one sign, change all signs. n minus n cancels. 2d minus 1d is makes 1d. And 900 minus 600 makes 300 dimes. And since there's 600 coins and 300 dimes, there have to be 300 nickels also. It's a coincidence the numbers came out the same. They don't have to. Uh, for example, if there were 100 dimes, 
100 plus 500 nickels would make 600 coins. If there were 50 dimes, 50 dimes plus 550 nickels would make 600 coins. So again, I'm making sure there's 600 coins, making sure this fact occurs. 300 plus 300 makes 600. Number four, we just uh, recently learned synthetic division, and um, the way we do synthetic division, it's, it's allowed because it's x plus or minus the number is required. Whatever we're dividing by, whatever makes this equal to zero, goes in this box. So that's minus three, so I put a plus three. Whatever this sign is, this is the opposite sign. Make sure that, that happens. The other part of synthetic division setup is this polynomial has to be represented here by its coefficients, leaving zero terms to represent um, missing powers of x. So I have 1x cubed. The highest power always shows up. So 1x cubed, 0x squared, 0x, and then negative 5 is the constant. Make sure those are in the right order. Highest power cubed, squared is missing, first power is missing, constant is there. Once you get the entire setup properly done, the technique goes as follows. The first number comes straight down. Always bring the first number straight down. Nothing ever happens to this number. They're always the same. Every next number up is a product of this number times the number in the box. So 1 times 3 is 3. Each next number down is the sum of the two numbers in the column. 0 plus 3 is 3. 3 times 3 is 9. 0 plus 9 is 9. 3 times 9 is 27. Negative 5 plus 27 is 22. Subtraction because the signs are different. Positive because 27 is bigger. The number in the box represents the remainder. Constant, x to the first, x to the second. So, 1x to the second, plus 3x to the first, plus 9, plus 22 over x minus 3 is how you would write the final answer. The plus signs are required. So, if this was negative 3, it would be minus. If this was negative 22, it would be minus. But it's positive 1, no sign in the front for positive required, but every other sign has to happen. So, positive 3x, positive 9, positive 22 over x minus 3. The power of this is always one bigger than the power of that, so you can kind of verify you have the right power set up. Uh, but again, that's synthetic division. If that doesn't make 100% sense to you, you can always go long division on that one also. I'm not going to go through that technique again. You're welcome to watch a previous video on that technique if you wish. Number five, factor the greatest common factor of this expression. And when I look at greatest common factor, I've got three types of things in this problem. I've got numbers. I have x's and I have y's and each of those things has the ability to go into the greatest common factor. It has to be common and it has to evenly divide everything properly. So uh, looking at the numbers 36, 24, and 60, if you can't immediately see it's 12, okay, by just by looking at it, Keep in mind there's factor, factoring that we can do. 36 is 2 squared times 3 squared. 24 is 2 cubed times 3 to the first. And 60 is 2 squared times 3 to the first times 5 to the first. Factor tree them, and you get down to the prime power factorizations. For common factors, we're looking for what's common. So there's a 2 in everything, and there's a 3 in everything. There's not a 5 in everything, there's only 5 in that one. And then we take the lowest power, 2, 3, 2, we take the 2. Uh, 1, 1, 2, we take the 1. So 4 times 3 is equal to 12 is the greatest common factor of the numbers. As far as x is concerned, um, x is in all three terms. Again, take the lowest power you see. We've got 2, 2, 3, take 2. Looking at the y's, my choices are 2, 3, 2, take the 2. And once I've taken out the greatest common factor of this expression, then I have to factor, which means I'm going to take each object divided by the common factor. 36 divided by 12 is 3. x squared divided by x squared cancels. y squared divided by y squared cancels. If this happened to be a 12, this would be a 1 that would have, would have to be written. Okay, but 3 is fine. Um, next number is negative 24 divided by 12 makes negative 2. x squared divided by x squared cancels. y cubed divided by y cubed makes y. Positive 60 divided by 12 is positive 5. x cubed divided by x squared makes x. y squared divided by y squared cancels. So there's the factored form that they're looking for on that problem. Number 6, factor completely. 
Uh, what I'm noticing here is I've got a in all three terms, so a is a common factor. I'm also noticing my x squared term is kind of a backwards term. So what I would do first, seeing that x squared is the thing that's not common, is I'd want to arrange it based on that. So negative ax squared minus 5ax plus 24a. I'm going to arrange it in terms of x. And again, a is a common factor, x isn't. Of course, there's no number that evenly divides 24, 5, and 1, so there's no numerical one either. So a would be my common factor usually, but since my highest power term is negative, I'm going to make it negative a that I'm taking out. So a is going to take a out of everything. The minus sign is going to change all the signs. So this becomes positive x squared, this becomes positive 5x, and this becomes negative 24. It's very, very important. We want this first term to be positive 1x squared when we're factoring this. A similar thing will happen on the test, whichever copy of the test you get. Um, you're going to have to take a negative out in order to create that as a positive x squared. At this point, we're looking for our magical two numbers that um, do what they're supposed to do, which is multiply to make a negative 24. 8 times negative 3 does that. They also have to add to make 5x. You can see 8 plus negative 3 makes positive 5. So 8 and negative 3 are the factors that will make this work. So this quadratic is going to be x plus 8 times x minus 3. And the negative a that was brought out to begin with is part of the factored form. To get full credit, you have to do all the way through to the end. It does say factor completely, and that means get it down as far as you possibly can. If you get me only to here, I'm not sure how I'm going to count off on that, whether it's going to be full credit or half credit. But just always look. If there's x to a power bigger than 1, chance there it'll factor again, so try and factor it again. Number seven, same deal. Um, notice I got x squared, x constant. If you take the a's off, everything is a squared, so there's a common factor of a squared. So again, rearrangement first. This is the highest power of x that's going to go in front. Followed by this has x to the first, that goes second. Finally, this has no x in it at all, that goes last. So again, arrange it properly first. After you've arranged it properly, common factor again, a squared, a squared, a squared. x, x, no x, so x isn't common. 9, 6, 1, nothing divides all three evenly. 3 divides both of these, but not 1, so only a squared is a common factor. But again, this is negative a squared x squared. My highest power term is negative. I don't like that, so I'm going to take a negative a squared out. The remaining polynomial is going to be positive x squared, minus, minus makes plus, a squared goes away, so 6x. Minus, minus makes plus. A squared goes away, so plus 9. Okay, again, the negative has to be taken out. The consequence is all the signs change their opposites. And then once again, I'm looking for factors of 9. It also add to make 6. 3 times 3 is 9. 3 plus 3 is 6. So x plus 3 times x plus 3 is the factored form of this trinomial. Negative a squared is still part of the factored form. Both of those problems are going to have a negative common factor being, being taken out. So 6 and 7 on your test, you'd expect a similar thing to happen. Uh, the quadratic trinomial left over should be factorable, so expect to factor that also. Number 8, simplest problem on the test. Term 1, term 2, term 3 all contain the letter x. Divide every one of those by x. 2x cubed divided by x is 2x squared. There is a plus sign. I'm going to put a plus sign. 3x divided by x is 3. x divided by x is 1. The end. It'll be just like that on the test. Every object will be obviously divisible by something. Divide by that thing. And then write the answer down. If this is a minus, this should be a minus. That's a plus, so it should be a plus. It's over 1, so it stays over 1. If this said x to the third, this be x squared, circle that at that point. So, you know, that kind of stuff could happen, but it'll be that type of problem. Every object has just as much right to be reduced by x as anything else. Most common mistake, people just chop those x's off, and don't worry about that one. All three objects have to be divided by x. Number nine. Three times the square root of seven being multiplied by the square root of 14, and negative three times the square root of seven. So if you do this one first, 3 times 1 makes 3 outside. Inside, I've got a 7 from here and a 7 times 2 from here. 
So inside the radical, don't multiply the numbers. Don't do 7 times 14 is 98. Instead, break it down the rest of the way. 7 is already prime. 14 is 7 times 2. 3, and this product here, 3 times negative 3 makes negative 9. I'm going to leave myself some space here, accounting for possibility of numbers coming out. Then I got my square root. 7 from out here, 7 from in there. So this 7 is prime, that 7 is prime. Again, instead of doing it 7 times 7 is 49, just keep it factored like so. Then all we have to do is take out common factors. Here, 7 times 7 is a common factor, so 7 gets to come out. Here, 7 times 7 is a common factor, so 7 gets to come out. Whatever came out is going to multiply together. So 7 times 3 is 21. Whatever stays in, stays inside a radical. So the square root of 2. Right here, 7 times 9 is 63. It's being subtracted, so minus 63. Everything came out, so the radical disappears. That's the answer. Okay, if that still had a number, let's say there was a 3 in there also. Square root of 3 is attached to it. In this case, there isn't, so that's the end. That's what the problem should look like on the test. It should have that kind of structure to it. Again, breaking down these things to all primes, so you look for pairs to come out. Anything stays in, it's going to stick in there. If there was a 2 and a 3 left in here, that would be square to 6, so you multiply things back together inside. In this case, just a single number left over, and, and actually no number left over just means that the radical, for all intents and purposes, is gone, so you're just left with whole numbers at that point for that piece. Number 10. Simplify 5 over 6 times the square root of 21. When you see the word simplify, you need to understand why it isn't. And why it isn't simplified is this is square root of 21 is in the denominator. That's illegal. We don't like that mathematically. So 5 over 6 times the square root of 21. Really focus in on that square root of 21. The issue, multiplying by the same exact thing, multiplying a radical times itself makes a non-radical. So Square root of 21 multiplication on the bottom fixes the issue. I'm required to multiply the square root of 21 times the top also because that's how fractions work. Multiply bottom and top by the same thing, you're creating an equivalent fraction. This product on top, 5 times the square root of 21, I can't do anything to make that any prettier. It's just going to be stuck together. On the bottom, 6 is already on the bottom. Square root of 21 times the square root of 21 makes 21. Square root of anything times itself just equals that thing without the radical on it. Uh, what's left is I got all these numbers 5, 21, and 6 outside. If any top number divides any bottom number, I can do that. 5 doesn't divide into 6 or 21. 5 is prime. So I can't make the top or bottom any prettier than what they are as far as reducing the fraction, but I can multiply 6 times 21. Temptation does exist here that we have a square root of 21, we have a 21. These numbers match. That's pretty common. Um, this is inside a radical, that's outside, so you can't get these interacting with each other. So when you're looking to reduce, only look at the numbers outside the radical. Nothing outside the radical reduces. So that is the simplified best answer there as possible. Uh, checking these is really simple. By typing the original problem, 5 divided by parentheses, 6 square root of 21 in parentheses for the square root, in parentheses for the bottom, equals. And then I type in 5 square root of 21, in parentheses, divided by 126. You should get the exact same decimal number. If you do, that means you have the exact right answer. If you don't, then you did something wrong. Check your work. Number 11, add. And what I'm noticing about number 11 is this is a quadratic trinomial in the denominator. So first job is to factor that trinomial x squared plus 6x plus 9, 3 times 3 makes 9, 3 plus 3 makes 6. That's being added to 2 over x plus 3. If I compare the denominators, x plus 3 is exactly the same in both of them. This second fraction has an x plus 3, but this second fraction doesn't have a second x plus 3, so I need a second x plus 3 on this one, which requires a second x plus 3 to be put on top. If I distribute this, I'm going to get 2x plus 6, which is being added. So in order to add the two fractions, I simply have to add the numerators as much as possible. I've got 3x plus 2x makes a total of 5x plus 6 all over x plus 3 squared. I'd be fine with leaving it as x plus 3 times x plus 3, or even x squared plus 6x plus 9, take your pick. 
The top has to be completely simplified. The bottom um, of our factored form, either this type or that type is fine, but again, you can go all the way back to the polynomial. If you don't add the 3x and 2x, I'm probably going to take off half credit. I want the, the top completely simplified. That includes adding all like terms that you can add. Number 12, in this figure, AB is the diameter and straight and a straight angle. So that means that AB, it should say AC. AC is a diameter and a straight angle. Let's do it this way. I'm going to keep it AB. We'll make this a C and this a B. There we go. AB is a straight angle, and they want the final length of arc BC. That's this one. Yeah, okay, perfect. All right, so. Um, if AB is a straight angle, that means that AB has exactly 180 degrees in it. And I can see very clearly that this angle plus this angle plus this angle adds up to 180 degrees then. So X plus 4X would have to equal 90 degrees. Since that's 90, there's 90 left over for this to make 180. That gives me 5X is equal to 90, therefore X equals 18. And also, therefore, 4x would equal 72. So just like that, x equals 18 degrees, 4x equals 72 degrees. I'm able to find the exact angle measure of each of these three angles in the picture. What they're asking me for is not the value of x or even the value of 4x, but they want the area of the sector and the length of the arc. Okay, so let's start with the area of the sector, this piece here. How much area is in there? So to find the area of the sector, I'm going to do the area of the circle. It says the radius of the circle is 7 meters. So the area of the circle is pi times 7 squared. That's the area of the whole circle. We only want to get the portion of the circle that's here, which is exactly 72 degrees over 360. So whatever the angle measure that is here goes over 360 times pi r squared. Then I just use my calculator to get that answer, so I would type in 72 times 3.14 times 49, all the top stuff, top, 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 divided by the bottom stuff, 360, and that gets me 30.772. Unit of length in this problem is meters, so that would be meters squared. The other question they asked me for is the arc length of BC, so how far is it from here around to here? That's part of the circumference, so if I look at the circumference of the circle, circumference formula for a circle is 2 pi times the radius, so that's the circumference of the whole circle, that'd be from B all the way around to B, the whole circle. We're only dealing with a 72 degree angle portion of the circle, so 72 over 360 being multiplied by that. Once again, all these are top numbers over 360, so again, my calculator, if I type in 72 times 2 times 3.14 times 7 divided by 360 equals, that gets me 8.792 meters. My advice in these problems always is write down on your paper what you're supposed to type in your calculator, then type it in correctly to get your correct answers to that. I'll make sure the letters match up on the test compared to the study guide because I didn't realize that was out of whack there. Number 13, solve 3x over 2 plus x minus 5 over 3 equals 3. My advice on these has been to start off by splitting this fraction here. So this is plus all this stuff. So it's going to be plus x over 3 minus 5 over 3 equals 3. So I'll make it into a bunch of simple fractions. Then, multiply by the least common denominator of the fractions. We have 2 and 3 are the only denominators. 2 times 3 is 6. So 6 is the least common denominator. Divide, then multiply. 6 divided by 2 is 3. 3 times 3x is 9x. 6 divided by 3 is 2 times x is 2x. 6 divided by 3 is 2 times negative 5 is negative 10. 6 divided by 1 is 6 times 3 is 18. Even non-fractions are going to multiply. That leaves me with 9x plus 2x minus 10 equals 18. I'm going to move the 10 over here. It changes sides, so it changes signs. 9x plus 2x makes 11x on the left. 18 plus 10 makes 28 on the right. You divide both sides by 11. And 28 11 is the right answer. Fraction answer, that's fine. Um, I've seen people get bent on a shape during a test. If they get a fraction answer, just know that they're possible on this one. Don't. Um, worry yourself. If, if you are concerned, just kind of check through your work, make sure you did it right, but 
you'll find that probably a fraction answer on this one. Number 14, find the distance between. Okay, what I'm looking for is a right triangle. It's made up of a horizontal distance and a vertical distance at right angles to each other to establish the actual distance of this thing. To find the horizontal distance, I simply have to ask myself, how far apart are these two numbers that represent x's? So if I'm at 2 and I move to 3, I've moved exactly one space. It doesn't matter about positive and negative numbers. If I'm moving from a negative 2 to a positive 6, negative 2 to 0 is 2 spaces, back up to 6 is eight, or a total of 8 spaces. So from negative 2 up to 6, negative 2 to 0 is 2, plus 6 more makes a total of 8. So again, just a matter of counting. How far apart are they? And if you want to graph these on graph paper to count, that's fine. Um, hopefully you can do it without. But 2 to 3 is 1, 6 to negative 2 is 8. Once I get the right triangle drawn, d squared is going to equal 8 squared plus 1 squared. So d squared is going to equal 64 plus 1. So d is going to equal the square root of 65. This very clearly says find the distance. It does not say find the equation of the line. Some of you are still doing that. You're, you're giving me the wrong answer. You're doing the wrong thing that they're not asking you to do. So make sure this one says find the distance. That's number 14. I'm looking for how far apart they are. How far apart are the x's? How far apart are the y's? Pythagorean theorem to find the length between. Number 15, expand. My advice on these has been to this point, make every term, this term outside the parentheses, this first term inside the parentheses, and this second term inside the parentheses, all as simple as possible. Positive powers, one of each letter. If it, if it doesn't look like that to begin with, fix it to begin with. You can see this one does not start off that way. This has a negative power and it has to be fixed. So 3 is fine, y cubed is fine, z squared is fine, x to the fourth belongs in the bottom. The green one, positive, positive, positive. Doesn't matter about the numbers. If, if it's negative 3, positive 3, as long as it's 3 to the first power. It's positive power. So all the powers are positive. There's one of each letter. That one's ready to go as is. So x to the fourth to z squared over 3y cubed. And then we've got this one. 5 to the first power, x to the third, z to the negative third, negative power, y to the negative four power. These two guys have to move. So it is a negative term. 5 is fine, x cubed is fine, z cubed belongs on top, and y to the fourth belongs on the bottom. So Priority one is that. Second step is the multiplication step. Multiply this times this. Don't even worry about canceling. Just do top times top, bottom times bottom. I like alphabetical order, so I'm going to do it in that way. So 3 is in front. x to the fourth power, no other x's. y to the third power, no other y's. z squared, no other z's. On the bottom, 3 goes in front. x to the fourth, no other x's. y cubed, no other y's. z squared, no other z's. So that's what we get out of that product. Obviously, it reduces. We'll worry about that in a minute. 3 times negative 5 makes negative 15. Always worry about the number first. On top, all the letters are different. I've got x cubed, y cubed, z cubed. On the bottom, all the letters are different. I get x to the fourth, y to the fourth, z squared. Once I've done that step, next step is to reduce. Z squared's cancel, y cubed's cancel, x to the fourth cancel, 3's cancel. Everything canceled, leave me with the number 1. It has to be written. Anytime you have something plus or minus something else, something is important. So you have to have something there. If you cross everything off and just say, that's gone, go away, we don't care about you, then you're going to be in trouble. So if everything cancels, you do have a one left over. The fact there's a one left over on the study guide tells me there's probably one left over on the test on all these two terms. Be careful of that. Uh, 15 is fine where it's at. X is bigger on the bottom, 4 minus 3 is 1. Y is bigger on the bottom, 4 minus 3 is 1. Z is bigger on top, 3 minus 2 is 1. So 1 minus 15, Z over X, Y would be the best simplified expansion of that problem. So that's kind of what I'm looking for for an answer. 